Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. All right, joining me on Postcards from a Dying World is... Omar L. Akkad, is that how you pronounce it? I'm terrible with pronunciation, but... Um, no, that was surprisingly well done. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate it. I, I just... Um, my dyslexia affects how I see new words that I don't know. So that is... And I, I definitely always apologize for that because I have a name that people always mispronounce. Agronoff. People always say Argonoff for some reason. But um, it is definitely not that. So, The American War is the novel we're talking about today. This is your debut novel, right? It is. It's the uh, fourth one I've written, the first one I ever tried to get published. Okay, so you've already answered one of my questions I have later on. Um, but tell me a little bit about your background um, and where you come from and how that informs this story, because I think that probably has something to do with it, I'd imagine. Yeah, I was born in Egypt. Uh, my family is Egyptian dating back, I don't know how many generations. Um, in the mid 80s, uh, actually, well, Egypt throughout my life has been pretty um, in a pretty bad place economically and politically, but it was particularly bad in the 80s when my father was trying to find work and he couldn't. And he ended up uh, finding a job in a place called Qatar, uh, which is this tiny peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. And um, it has become since then, you know, pound for pound, the richest country on earth. Um, they have one of the largest natural gas reserves. And so they needed bodies. And Qatar's population is only 10% Qatari. 90% uh, of the population is from somewhere else, sort of coming to cash in on the oil money. And my dad was one of those people. And so at the age of five, I left Egypt and I spent the next 11 years in Qatar. Um, but Qatar is also a place where they work really hard to protect the oil wealth. So you can't get citizenship. Uh, you can't just show up and get citizenship. There was no way we were ever going to be able to sort of own a house or start a business or anything like that. So when I was 16, uh, we moved to Canada. Um, I got my citizenship in Canada. I consider myself pretty well Canadian um, today. Uh, I went to college in Canada, got my first job as a journalist at the Globe and Mail, which is the national paper up there. And for the next 10 years, I was a journalist. I covered, uh, I was in Afghanistan during the invasion. I was in Guantanamo Bay covering the um, military trials. I was in Cairo during the Arab Spring. I was in Ferguson during the protests. And um, a few years ago, I started working on a novel that sort of took the residual emotional baggage that I had from, from many of these assignments and kind of put them all in one place in one narrative. And that turned out to be American War. Uh, I sold that to Knopf in the fall of 2015. And then uh, six months later, I quit my job at the Globe and I've been making stuff up ever since. Right. Well, and I would imagine that um, you could have written a nonfiction book um, about these issues, but there are lots of nonfiction books about the history and politics of, of the Middle East. Was, there, was that the motivation for writing a fictional novel, is thinking that maybe that might be an easier way to get your point of view across? Or was it just a fun concept that came to you while, while there? That's a really interesting question. I, there's two reasons why I never went down the nonfiction book route. Well, three reasons if you count my likely inability to be able to pull one off. Like, I don't know if I actually have the talent to pull that, to pull that off if I'm not allowed to just invent things as I go along. Um, I The first has to do with just, um, the difference between questions and answers. I consider nonfiction journalism specifically, but nonfiction generally to be a place I go for answers. Who, what, where, when, how. If you don't have answers to these questions, you probably don't have the load-bearing beams for a work of nonfiction, even creative nonfiction or whatever you want to call it. Um, I had no answers. I only had question and fiction is where I go for questions. There, you know, if you read American War, there's, there's no prescriptive aspect to it. There is no chapter that says, if we do X, Y, Z, we will be able to avoid the worst outcomes. That's not what I was in it for. Mm -hmm. So that drew me towards fiction. Um, 
The other is just the ability to, to mask what you're actually trying to do. Um, so in the Arab world and in Arab literature, because of the political climate over the past hundred years or so, we've gotten really good at hiding what we actually want to say. And there are very real reasons for that. I mean, there's an author named Ahmed Nagy in, in Egypt who spent two years in pretrial detention because he wrote a book with a sex scene that someone didn't like. So they filed a complaint uh, and he was jailed for two years because of that sex scene. And so you learn very quickly that you um, can't just say the thing you want to say. And fiction is an easier place to do that. One of the really famous examples is Nagib Mahfouz, who's probably the most famous Arab novelist of the last hundred years, the only Arab to win a, to win a Nobel Prize for Literature. He wrote a book a long time ago called Wilad uh, Haritna, which translates to uh, Children of Our Alley, something like that. And it's just stories, each, you know, a story of each chapter or each section is a story of um, one, a kid in this old neighborhood in Cairo. And it's sort of like very benign on the surface, but then you realize that what he's doing is actually taking the stories of the Abrahamic prophets and recasting them as stories of, of Ali children. And when the Muslim Brotherhood found out about this and, and caught on to what he was trying to do, they sent someone to stab him in the neck. He almost died over this book. Um, so if you want to, you know, you, so it's a skill set that you learn because of the context that you're in. If I had written a book called Middle Eastern War um, and, you know, a novel, Middle Eastern War, that would have been received very, very differently than right. the book titled American War. And so there's certain, certain reasons you go down the roads that you do, and they're not always ideal reasons or reasons that speak to an ideal world. Yeah, and I have a friend who um, is, is Iranian. Uh, his parents are Iranian immigrants, and, and um, he, uh, I had asked him at one point about, um, is there Iranian, science fiction, you know, that addresses these issues. And he was like, well, of course there's Iranian science fiction, but um, how much they address the issues is a different issue because of, you know, that, that kind of fear of, of um, you know, of expressing yourself directly. And, I, and so I do think it's interesting. And that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to look at the way um, science fiction is handling the war on terror, and, and we'll get into more gener gener generalities after we talk more about your book. Um, but you, um, I would imagine your time as as a reporter there um, heavily informed this. Um, do you have any moments where you were in country doing this kind of reporting that? directly related to inspire the events that became the American War? Yes, lots. Um, I'll, I'll speak to one of them that sticks out in my head. Um, when I was about 25, I got my first assignment in Afghanistan. And at the time, uh, there was still a major Canadian military presence there. And that's why the Canadian newspapers were still interested in Afghanistan. As soon as that presence started to wind down, we sort of lost interest. Um, and so I was shipped off and I spent a lot of my time in the NATO airfield in Kandahar. The NATO airfield is this sort of sprawling base that is uh, a sea of shipping containers, you know, repurposed shipping containers, um, tents. Um, there, at the time I was there, there were about 25,000 soldiers and officers and sort of support staff stationed at this place. So it was a small city, basically. Uh, there was a Burger King, there was, you know, all kinds of stuff. And um, you get there and the way that this base is protected is there's an inner wire and an outer wire. And the inner wire is defended by the NATO soldiers. So state of the art training, state of the art equipment, body armor, guns, the, the works. The outer wire, which is right on the highway, it's basically the interface between Kandahar province and the, and the base is protected by Afghan soldiers. So universally almost, almost always 18, 19 year old uh, kids, basically, with no real armor. Um, usually the weapons that the Soviets left behind 30 years late, earlier. Um, but, but by its nature, if there's going to be an attack on this base, it's going to be at the outer wire. If somebody puts a bomb in their car and decides to ram it into the, the side of the base, they're going to end up hitting the outer wire. And that was fully understood by everybody involved in this endeavor. 
So here I was covering this war where everybody was supposed to be on the same side here. And yet there was still a hierarchy of whose lives were more dispensable than others. And that was a grim and very obvious kind of education for me. It um, was like there were there were actual layers where it's like, here's the most expendable person, here's the next most expendable person. <laughs> and wow, yeah, that's that's brutal. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I ended up using that almost verbatim in one of the, um, you know, American yeah, has that source document stuff, and there's one scene where literally, like, <laughs> here's here's the fodder, here's the cannon fodder, and they're out in the front. So, so um, that was that was definitely one of them. But there were lots. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd imagine too, um, being that you know a huge part of your childhood was spent in in Qatar, that. Um, going to Afghanistan is still like going to a whole nother world. It's not, you know, it's a totally different experience too. So seeing the war through, seeing the war through the eyes, you're still a stranger in a strange land going in to, to that part of the world. Uh, I'm sure that informed this book as well. Yeah, I mean, Qatar belongs to that group of countries that are just incredibly wealthy by virtue of stuff that's in the ground. I mean, you know, Qatar, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Um, and I don't begrudge anybody, you know, having that kind of resource, uh, climate change aside, I guess, and what it's doing to the planet aside. But, but it does generate a huge, like, chasm between your experience if you live in that part of the world and elsewhere. I remember going to Afghanistan. I flew through uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And the airport in Dubai, like everything in Dubai is, is beautiful. It's, it's you know no expenses spared, money is no object, so on and so forth. But at the time, there were a number of terminals and you go to, I forget which one it was, but you go to sort of terminal one, gorgeous, duty-free stores, a Maserati parked in the middle of the run, you know, like that sort of thing. Terminal two, same thing. Terminal three, which I flew out of, looked like it hadn't been repaired in 30 years. And you look at the departure screen and it's Kandahar, Kabul, Djibouti, the places that the people who built this airport do not want mingling with what the rest of the world sees as, as Dubai luxury. And so even in that tiny setting, you had this situation where there was a kind of segregation of the parts of the world that we consider inferior and too violent and too elsewhere to be part of the grouping. Uh, and that was just in an airport. That was even before you got there. Well, and, and yeah, see, that's that's an experience that many Americans don't know anything about, you know. Yeah, it's. I mean, one of the things about this country is that it's so it's so loud and so dominant that there's a sense of like. It, it's it's tempting to think that the things that happen here are unique to here. But a lot of things that happen to America aren't unique to America. There's lots of things that I see here, and they echo to my experiences in Egypt and Qatar. It's just that the volume of this place is so high that it, it's very easy to sort of drown out a lot of the rest of the world. Right. All right, so um, early in, t well, so you said you've written four novels. Um, was this the first one that you attempted or had you attempted other novels? Yes, yeah, so I wrote three novels before this one. Um, the, the technical literary term for them is um, not very good. And so I never, I never tried to, uh, I, I only showed them to my best friend and, and that was generally it. I never tried to publish them or show them to an agent or anything. And in fact, American War was going to also just sit on the hard drive. I had no intention of, of publishing it. And then one day I had a bad day at work. I had a day where I felt like I was just rewriting press releases and I didn't think that that was a useful um, contribution to the world by a journalist. And so at the end of that day, I, I uh, emailed this literary agent who I'd met randomly eight years earlier. And I said, listen, I know that it's every literary agent's worst nightmare when a journalist says, I have a novel for you, but I have a novel for you. Uh, would you mind taking a look? And she was kind enough to do that. And three months later, we sold it to Knopf. Well, and, and the, the reasons are obvious. It's very good. Um, oh, you're kind. And, thank you. <laughs> well, I think what bleeds off the page is, is the experience. And um, it's funny, when I wrote my review uh, for my blog, I didn't think I connected the dots that you had been a journalist and country uh, covering covering these wars. And I think that um, now makes a lot of the novel make sense because it's one thing to, um, 
to read about war or to experience, but it's a whole other thing to experience war. I recently did an interview with a friend of mine who was an embedded journalist and he, um, you know, spent time in Iraq and Af Afghanistan having to sometimes smuggle himself across the border. Um, and so when I, you know, talked to him about these things, I realized that, um, you know, getting his perspective is really valuable because um, he has experiences that I, I can't ever imagine. And I, so I think that being a journalist um, shouldn't be the worst nightmare of, of a literary agent to hear from, <laughs> from you, because I think that that provided you uh, an insight into this book that that makes it sing um, for many reasons. So I and, and I was a great fan of it. Um, I want before we get like really um, heavily into spoilers. Um, uh, I want to talk generally about it uh, initially, but, um, and we'll give everybody a spoiler warning when we're getting <laughs> more deep into it because um, there, there, there are some twists and turns in it. Although I don't really think this book can be spoiled, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, me neither, uh, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah my, my friend that recommended it to me um, uh, told me a great deal about the book and it didn't hurt my experience. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, but the germ of the, this idea, I, I'm assuming you had it during your journeys or how far back does the, the germ of, of, of this idea go? It goes back a ways. Um, I mean, one of the fun things you get to do after you've published a novel is come up with a very clean Genesis story for it. You know, this happened, this happened, then I wrote a book. Um, in my case, the story I always go back to in terms of like the moment that I started thinking about the things that led to this book is this vague recollection I have from many, many years ago, more than 10 years ago now, of uh, watching this interview. I don't remember if it was on CNN or one of the other networks, but it was an interview with this foreign affairs expert, you know, this talking head. And the interview was taking place in the immediate aftermath of a set of uh, protests that had happened in Afghanistan. Villagers were protesting against the US military presence. And the question that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he noted that sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And that when they do this, they will sometimes ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. Uh, and then he very helpfully added, uh, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. And I thought, like, name me one culture on earth that wouldn't consider well, this sort not of offensive. Thing. Yeah. Right. Like, if they'd done this in Sweden, would they be welcomed? Like, is that some kind of niche that I'm not aware of? Um, because in Texas, they would totally be all about it, right? Exactly, right? I mean, you know, in Texas, Obama got elected, and suddenly you had people like stocking up rifles because they thought that they were going to, the, the military was going to raid. Uh, their freedoms, or I don't know, you know, like it's this kind of thing that this, this deliberate imposition of, of exotic motivations on the part of people who would react the same way you'd react if you were on the receiving end of this kind of damage. And that's what it, when I first started thinking about this idea of taking the hallmarks of the wars that have defined the world in my lifetime, so the past 40 years, basically. And these are wars in which US involvement has either been indirect or from a great distance, and we cast them as something close to home. And I couldn't think of anything closer to home than the Civil War, where you're fighting yourself. Right. Well, and and I always, I think I think of this in the sense of because I'm I'm a radical and have been a radical for a long time, politically. Uh, the moment 9/11 happened, I immediately was one of the rare people saying, you know, like that had an answer for why do they hate us right away, where the rest of America, a lot of most of America was stunned. I was not one of those people. And um, so from the beginning, the idea that this, uh, that science fiction is, is using genre or speculative fiction to um, examine the issues of that question, why do they hate us and what's going on it is, is actually, I think an important thing for the genre to do. And I wish more of science fiction would, would handle these issues. Um, that's one of the reasons why I was glad to see your novel. Now, I would, I would say for myself, on, um, I was a, um, working in a high school as a teacher on 
and um, a teacher's aide, technically. But um, I have a very distinct memory. Uh, this was in, Indi in, in, in Indiana, September 11th, 2001. And one of the things that happened for me, which I think is an interesting window into my perspective, is that I was walking down the hallway. I had been in the teacher's lounge when I first saw the stuff on the news. And I came out in the hallway and I didn't know how many people knew what was going on yet. And a student, a high schooler, came running down the hallway saying, Iraq just attacked us. We just got attacked by Iraq. <laughs> and being that I was already a radical or whatever, I just was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Dude, we don't know who did this. You have no idea who did this. You need to calm down. And he was like, no, dude, we just got attacked by Iraq. And it was amazing to me because I told some people like, this guy was way ahead of George W. Bush, <laughs> right? But um, blaming Iraq and eventually um, I took a bold move because at that school, I gave the guy a detention for creating um, uh, a mess. And one of the things that we had to do at that school was that we had to give an assignment. And I gave the guy an assignment to write about Timothy McVeigh um, because I was trying to make a point. And um, so what's interesting to me is with this idea that through speculative fiction, you have a chance to, to reach these people who are not thinking um, about what it means <laughs> or why they hate us by flipping the war on terror, right? And you're, um, a couple writers have done this. Uh, Matt, Matt Ruff did this with the Mirage. Um, he did it in a more science fictional, uh, um, Kind of alternate universe way uh but here this is definitely our universe but i would say it because it's our future even though the book is not marketed as science fiction it's definitely speculative fiction it's also dystopia and i would say it's even climate fiction cli-fi mm -hmm. um how do you what's your experience with the genre are you a reader of science fiction or did you have to kind of wing it on that aspect i mean my my reading habits are sort of to use a horrible analogy it doesn't quite work it's sort of like wandering through a furniture store blindfolded i mean you feel around and if something feels comfortable you're not particularly concerned whether it's the lazy boy section or the whatever section i um i i, I jump around a lot and i look for whatever works for me uh, one of the advantages of writing this book while having no publisher, no agent, no book deal, no expectation it would go out into the world, is that I didn't have to worry about where it would be slotted in. Um, in fact, I did not know the term cli-fi until I saw it applied to my book in an article after it was published. Um, that's a function of my own ignorance more than anything else, but it would just sort of goes to the point that I wasn't thinking in those terms when I was writing it. Um, you know, Jorge and Luis Bor has once said that all literature is basically tricks and no matter how clever your tricks are, they eventually get discovered. Well, some of the central tricks in the world of speculative fiction are inversion and extrapolation. And so by that definition, American War is definitely a piece of speculative fiction. Those are the two central tricks in the book. They're not particularly clever. They're not particularly hard to figure out, but that's what the book is based on sort of thematically or structurally. Um, I am fascinated by the places where they bleed right, where, where the one genre bleeds into the other. So I'm thinking of books like Ahmed Sadawi's um, Frankenstein in Baghdad, which is a retelling of Frankenstein, except now it's, it's modern day, it's in Baghdad, and the monster's limbs are uh, taken from the victims of sectarian violence and car bombings. And it is a very philosophical book. It's a very quiet book. It's not bang, bang. It's not horror. It's not... Um, easily turned into a movie. Um, but it uses some of those central tricks. And in that sense, it is doing something with speculative fiction that is deeply political, and yet still feel, feels like it's within that genre. And that, that to me is really interesting when you're doing new things with the form and within the form. And that's what I was sort of trying to do in hindsight, but to give you, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I was never thinking in those terms when I was writing the book because I didn't think the book would ever get published. Right. Well, and, and no, and you don't have to because, you know, I mean, obviously I'm a big sci-fi guy. 
that's like one of you know one of my genres so i think about it um and uh i was in the early stages of, of editing a, um, one of my novels when i discovered that cli-fi was a thing because i again had like you had written one <laughs> and uh like saw that this was the term that was going, going to be applied but this novel is definitely cli-fi because um it, the climate change aspects of it uh definitely play a role in uh the future future america and the world building but what's interesting to me is is that um the world building is such a huge aspect of the american war and it's interesting for me to because uh world building is such a you know it's like one of the columns that holds up science fiction and if you weren't even thinking in terms of science fiction um but you were thinking in terms of world building though when you were writing that you were think uh, you, you must have because very good <laughs> thank you that's uh, that's very kind of you I, I i was so one of the reasons that the book is structured the way it is uh, and, the, and the structure of it is that you have this narrative but in between the chapters you have these fake historical documents from the future because the book is set about you know 50 years in the future and um those fake historical documents, you know, letters from the governor, oral histories, you know, clippings from newspapers in the future, all of that was never intended to go in the book in the beginning. It was just a means for me to sort of keep track of this fictional world that I was creating. And because I trained as a journalist and worked as a journalist for, for 10 years, I was very familiar with, with bureaucratic speak and freedom of information requests and the kind of that kind of world. And so I decided to keep track of important events and dates using those documents. And then much later on in the process, realized that if I inserted them directly into the text, I could do something really interesting that I couldn't do with a straightforward narrative. So some of the world building came about that way. It came about beginning with, with like a crutch for me to keep track of this world that I was creating because it had so many moving parts and then slowly working its way into, into the text. Um, it is one of my favorite things to do, to draw maps of fictional places, to, to wander around in my head in these invented locations. And one of the first things I did when I was conceiving the America in which this, this story takes place is I went to one of these websites that lets you visualize sea level rise and I crank that dial up as high as it would go, which is about 70 meters or something. And suddenly the coast is washed out and um, in fact, the place where the story starts, southern Louisiana, that place is also washed out, but I really wanted to start it there, so I moved it up on a hill just to sort of get that. So you start messing with the contours of the real world in a way that that is not only incredibly empowering, um, but also allows someone like me, who's been a migrant since the age of five, to, to not think of national borders and national sovereignty in, in ironclad terms, to be able to mess around with them. That, that also feels very empowering. So certainly the world building aspect of it was the place where, where I was closest to that childhood joy of, of sort of really living in a made up place for a while. The book is a made up place in which to live. That, that was a really invigorating thing and it reminded me of why I fell in love with this stuff in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, no, well, it, it, it comes out and, uh, uh, through the book. So we're going to get into um, a little bit more of the spoiler territory after this question, but um, the last, just for anyone out there who hasn't been convinced yet to, to read The American War, um, it seems to me that, the, um, and you kind of already said this, but this is a question that I have written, and I, I, I want to make sure that we clearly say this for, for people, but it seemed to me that the mission of this book was to, you know, flip the war on terror to make people here realize what it would feel like if this conflict was happening on their soil so they could get an understanding of, of, of what it meant. Was it, would you say that's the mission statement that you kind of came with when, when, you, when you started writing this book? I think so. The book went through 12 drafts and the original first line in the first draft was uh, revenge is recursive. 
So I was trying to get at this idea that damage begets damage. So it's a book about radicalization, how somebody becomes radicalized, how somebody can be turned into a terrorist or an extremist. But thematically, or I guess polemically, um, it is a book that argues that there's no such thing as a foreign kind of suffering. Um, those people on the other side of the planet who are on the receiving end of the bombs are not behaving in some fundamentally exotic way. Um, you know, that's, that's, there's a line in the book where one of the characters says the universal slogan of war is, uh, if it was you, you'd have done no different. And I think that's generally the, the argument that the book is trying to make. Mm -hmm. True. Okay. We're getting into more direct spoiler territory um, here. And um, it seems like the fractures of this future America um, are inspired by tribal differences. Um, it seemed like Iraq or Syria seem to be the uh, influence, but you know that's just my outsider take in reading this. How did you develop the the fractures? Did you spend a lot of time thinking about like um, what culture in the South looks like, or because a lot of it takes place in the South? Yeah, I mean, I, I went to the South a lot. I, for the last four years of my ten years at the Globe and Mail, I was based in the U.S., so I was basically a foreign correspondent covering the United States for a non-American audience. Mm -hmm. And I traveled the country a lot, and a lot of my stories were in the South. Uh, I went to Louisiana to cover climate change. Uh, Southern Louisiana is disappearing at the rate of about a football field of land every half hour. Um, it's literally melting into the, the Gulf of Mexico. And once I saw that environment, I knew that that's, I'd been thinking about American war as a concept. And I, I, as soon as I landed, I knew that this is where it had to start because I don't think of American war as an American book. It is concerned with things America has done, but it's not concerned with telling an American story. This isn't how I think a second civil war would go down. None of the book is a literal attempt at prophecy or anything like that. Um, but it is concerned with things America has done to and in the world. And since it is a work of inversion, I wanted to start it in a place where the world was doing something to America. So climate change does not care in the slightest what borders it's violating. Um, one of the things that I would, I get, in, I get in a bit of trouble for saying this, but one of the things that I, that was strange about being in the South was that I always felt this, I've never felt at home anywhere. Um, just by nature of the life I've led, I've never been comfortable anywhere. Um, home for me is people or sort of relationships. It's not a place. Mm -hmm. And there was this, this, there was a very strange sense of, of not comfort, but, but just sort of recognition whenever I would go to the South. And I never fully understood why, because on every overt criteria, this place was nothing like anywhere I'd ever lived. But I would constantly find myself meeting people who were incredibly hospitable but also incredibly tied to some very old traditions and ways of thinking. Some of them good, some of them horrible, and God help you if you challenge them on any of it. And I thought, well, this is what it's like to grow up in the Middle East. You're surrounded by people who are incredibly hospitable, tied to some very old traditions and ways of thinking, and God help you if you challenge them on any of them. And so when I was thinking about this book that's kind of an inversion or an overlaying of somebody else's story, that having those two places overlap in such a weird non-overt way um, kind of solidified what I was trying to do. Um, and I'm sure covering the Ferguson, um, my, uh, it was Michael Brown that was shot there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I landed the day after they, the jury decided not to indict his killer. And I'm sure covering that influenced the book. Too. Yeah, I mean, that was another instance of exactly what I was talking about with the South. I've only been tear gassed twice in my career as, as a journalist. And uh, those two times were in Cairo during the Arab Spring and in Ferguson the night of the protests when I was there. And that's not to say that being in one of those places somehow gives you a heightened understanding of the other, only that there were echoes. So the heavily militarized police presence, these light armored vehicles, these military vehicles, um, people who are so fed up with injustice that they're willing to stand in the way of these, of this militarized presence. Um, all of that reinforced this idea that there is no exotic kind of suffering, that people react the same way when they're subjected to injustice. Um, and so at that time, yeah, I was starting to put this thing together, starting to think about it. And that really sort of clarified a couple of the major thematic elements of the book. 
So I know this is kind of going away from the book, but you said something that I, I can't ignore. Um, <laughs> um, the Arab Spring, what do, you, what do you think that Americans most misunderstand about the Arab Spring? Was that anything that you touched on in the book or is, is that a separate issue? <laughs> so in the book, in the future world of the book, the American empire and America as a superpower is on is on the decline and it's fading away. And there's this new superpower, it's called the Boazizi Empire. And it's basically a whole bunch of countries in North Africa and the Middle East that have congealed into a single empire. Uh, Boazizi is the name of the man who set himself on fire in, in Tunisia after being harassed by the authorities. And um, his death, his suicide was the prompt for the protests that eventually became the Arab Spring. So that's where that name comes from. And in this future world, I've, I've sort of, I posit that there was one Arab Spring, it failed, there was a second, third, fourth, and then they got it right. And then they, they finally won. And the result of, you know, the successful Arab Spring, the fourth or fifth iteration, I forget which, um, then creates this new empire. Basically, I took the American creation story and recast it as a story of, of the creation of a new empire. Um, so certainly seeing what the Arab Spring was, which was people so fed up that they were willing to risk their lives. And many people died, including you know people I know, people who, who grew up in the same neighborhoods as me in Egypt and, and, and sort of risked everything. I mean, the Hayo Square is, is down the street from where I grew up until the age of five, from where I lived downtown. Um, you know, for, for folks on this side of the planet, there really is no consequence for not understanding that movement. And I, I don't say that as a criticism, that's just the reality of being on the privileged side of the planet. Um, but one of the things, when you look at the protests, the initial protests were, slogans were very short and they were basically like three words, you know, justice. One of the words that they were screaming was bread. And so you think like, why are people out on the streets risking their lives screaming bread? Well, bread was an analogy for cost of living. I can no longer afford bread to feed my family. That is not some kind of exotic Middle Eastern or North African thing. That brings people to the streets in any context, any society you can think of. And so a lot of times I go back to this thing that William Gibson once said, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, a lot of these places that when you live on this part of the planet, it's easy to think of as being very far away and very different are actually an extrapolation of the injustices that are present in this society. And it's not like you are immune to the same forces or something like that. It's, it's, it may well happen here one day. And in many, in many parts of this country, it's already happening. Uh, it's just happening to people that at the institutional level, we don't care about. Yeah. What comparisons do you see between having witnessed the Arab Spring and, um, kind of the, um, uh, well, for a kinder word, clusterfuck that America has become in the, <laughs> in the aftermath of COVID because, <clears throat> I mean, thankfully we're currently holding it together, but the next 48 hours are gonna be really interesting <laughs> um, when, when we're recording this. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, of how much of what we've said so far is going to seem completely irrelevant after the third, you know, like who knows what's coming down that pipeline. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the things that worries me the most about, about this country and is based on my experiences living on the other side of the planet is what happens when you have a class of human beings in power. And I, I don't want to be coy about this. I'm talking about the Republican Party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a class of human beings in power who fundamentally believe that there are two groupings of people. There's the upper grouping who should be the first to benefit when anything goes right. And there's, there's the lower grouping of people who are the first to suffer when anything goes wrong. This is fundamentally, in my view, the belief of the Republican Party. Uh, in a sense, they have an inner wire and an outer wire. Mm. And we can sort of you know, make distinctions on whether they believe that the axis that that happens along is an axis of wealth or an axis of race or whatever you want to talk about. But fundamentally, I think everything the Republican Party does is, is predicated on that belief. 
Look, you grew up in a part of the world where that is also the case, right? Like the, yeah. the, there's here are the people who will suffer and here's the people who will benefit. But what you're talking about is not metaphor. We've seen it in the last couple of days that Trump at two different rallies, not once, but twice, left his people stranded to freeze to <laughs> death um, without shuttle buses as soon as he blew out from his rallies. So the inner wire and the outer wire that you're talking about is, you know, when that happened the first time in Omaha, my first thought was I've never seen a metaphor brought to life <laughs> so much in reality. It's like, it's it's insane. and and. You know, I, I have my problems with the Democrats too, but um, there's a difference between like actively being evil and just being not so good at standing up for yourself. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I see what you're saying, and 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 I. But I think Americans, you know, it was interesting to see because I didn't see as many people supporting the Arab Spring as much as I thought they would. And, um, and when it kind of came and went, you know, it, it is an interesting thing in your novel that, that you talked about it being like the fifth or sixth time that, that, that it worked. Um, that separation between the ruling elites and the, the general population, um, it's funny for Americans to think that they're so different from the, that they think that just because on November 3rd, they're able to color in a box on a piece of paper that 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 they're not, you know, suffering from the same things is 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 very naive. And that's one of the things that I appreciated about this novel is it's a it's a good uh, wake up call for those who are smart enough to read it the right way. <laughs> I mean, thank you. It's it's, uh, you know, there are clearly institutional differences. Uh, the, inst the, the democratic institutions of the United States, as much as they've taken a beating, uh, are still far stronger than anything that exists in the part of the world where I grew up. So a lot of the institutional systems are capable of withstanding the stress. I'm just saying that the forces at work are not fundamentally different. Um, and the place you end up is not fundamentally different, which why, why one of the things that I worry about when I see protests here um, is what I saw in, in Egypt, which is this fixation on the figurehead. You know, we're going to remove the president. Well, sure, you, you, you've sort of, you've, it's like a brush fire. You know, you've cleared out the leaves, but the roots are still there. All the judges that this president appointed, all the sycophants, all of the infrastructure that has bled into every part of the country, much harder to get rid of with a, with a revolution. And I, I see sort of a a mirror of the same thing here. The number of people who have become members of the, you know, hashtag resistance and their focus is we got to get Trump out, we got to get Trump out. Well, how do you think Trump got to where he is? There's an entire infrastructure of rot that it's very hard to, to, to fix or reform via the means of popular protest. Popular protest works really well when there's one guy's face you can put on a poster. Um, and so I worry about if Trump is not reelected and we get Joe Biden, who I mean, again, he, 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 I don't agree with everything he has to say, but at least he's someone who can be measured along the normal political axes. Um, and I worry that, you know, November 4th, half the hashtag resistance goes away because they've achieved what they've wanted to achieve. And all those hundreds of federal judges that were appointed in the meantime, and all those people who now run all of these agencies and are throttling immigration and uh, deregulating the environment and so on and so forth are still gonna be there, except you can't put all of that on the poster. And so I, I worry about that in the long run. Especially because we ended up with the democratic candidate who was the least transformative <laughs> of, of, all the, of, of all the options. And, you know, it is really sad when you're watching the debates and you realize like out of this entire country, these are the two that we came up with, um, honestly. <laughs> um, but, you know, look, uh, and I know it's a different situation for you as a Canadian living here, um, but it's, but you are living in this country. So you as far as I'm concerned, you, you have every right to uh, be upset and frustrated with those of us who didn't do enough. Um, but anyway, so the American War, I did notice that um, the 
one of the pages I dog-eared was um, was specifically 139, a page where um, the things we were just talking about are very clearly explained by a visitor from the Middle East. And so um, uh, the fail, it's one of the scenes where he talks about, you know, we had to do this a bunch of different times. And this was obviously something that I caught on to um, when I was reading it enough that I dog-eared the page. But um, this book has many themes and many ideas that um, that are seen through the eyes of, uh, how do you, do you pronounce it, Serrat? Um, because it's, yeah. Sarah, In my head it's always Serrat, but yeah. Surratt, yeah, um, the main character. Um, and her radicalization in the book is one of the, the key through lines. But you did some interesting things with the structure of the novel too, because um, part of the way through, uh, we kind of switched POVs to, um, to a, one of her nieces, I believe it is. Um, I've, it's been like two weeks since I read the book. So, um, <laughs> which shouldn't be that long, but I read a lot. So I'm ingesting. No, I hear you. It's, it's also a kitchen sink book. There's a lot, there's a lot happening in there. Right, it is the niece, right? It is. It's a nephew, it's Benjamin, Benjamin uh, Chestnut, yeah. Okay, I was close. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, her radicalization seemed really important. How much time and energy did you put specifically into making sure that, that her, that you had her radicalization exactly how you wanted it? A lot. I um, started as a full-time journalist in, at the Globe and Mail on a Monday in, I believe it was 2006, in the summer of 2006. And that Friday, we had the largest terrorism arrest in Canadian history. We had this thing called the Toronto 18 case, which is these 18 kids who, who uh, and some of them were kids, some of them were like 17 years old, who had all these grand plans of uh, blowing up the public broadcaster and beheading the prime minister and all this nonsense, none of it came, came to pass. They were being watched the whole time. And on that Friday, our federal police force swooped in and, and arrested them. And for about two weeks, it was the biggest story in the world. And for two years, it was the biggest story in Canada. And so I spent the first two years of my journalistic career trying to figure out how these kids who were brought up in the suburbs of Toronto and the most sort of benign suburban upbringing you can think of would go from that to building uh, detonators off of YouTube videos and you know that sort of thing. And you start to see a couple of, of traits, a couple of, of recurring sort of patterns. One is just the slowness of it, the slow meticulous nature of it. So there were, most of these 18 were kids, but there were like two or three guys who were older. And these were the mentors, the sort of father figures and they had no plans of ever like strapping on the suicide vest themselves or doing any of this stuff themselves, but they were sort of goading these kids along. And I discovered at one point towards the end, just before the arrests happened, one of these older gentlemen takes one of these kids up to the forest north of Toronto. And previously in the, in the day, he had gone up there and dug a grave in the forest. He dug this big hole. And so they go up there at night. He takes them there. He says, lie down in this hole. The kid lies down in the hole. And he tells them, this is what eternity is going to look like for you if you don't commit these acts, if you don't commit martyrdom, if you don't do this. You don't get to go to heaven. You just lie here and the worms eat you up forever. Now, you can imagine if I was trying to radicalize you right now and I led with that, you would immediately tell me to fuck off, right? But this, was a, this came at the end of a years-long gradual progression that began on the other side years earlier with this guy saying something like, hey brother, did you see what they're doing to your Muslim brothers and sisters in Chechnya? Did you see what they're doing to your Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine? Um, it started very slow and it kind of worked its way up. And I wanted to get at that with, with the book, this idea that you don't, just, you don't just convert somebody to this kind of way of thinking overnight. You have to be meticulous and it has to be somewhat unclear to an observer whether you genuinely care about this person you're radicalizing or whether you actually are just using them. And I think the relationship between Surratt and her mentor, Albert Gaines in the book, that's what I was trying to do was get at this idea of, does he genuinely care about her and think that this is the best way for her to be in the world or is he just using her for his own ends? Um, so a lot of what I saw 
in those two years covering those terrorism cases made its way into the book. Yeah, that um, that's so important to to what we ended up with with the American War. I think is 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 that journalistic experience, and and you know it's it's crazy because um, look from my perspective, I I, I am a radical, <laughs> um, and I spent I'm uh, spent a lot of time in activism through environmentalism and animal rights and um have definitely been called a terrorist before um <laughs> uh for for my um activism and i you know it's funny because when i write about radicalization with characters like a lot of times i can look in the mirror <laughs> right i can look and see in my experience and um and i think that it's a tricky thing because there there's a really easy way for writers to trivialize how radicalization happens if you know they just think oh their mom was killed and now they're going for revenge well that's how you set up an 80s action movie that's not necessarily <laughs> how you radicalize a character and yes, what happens to their family can can and should be important. But that, but what I appreciated here was that, um, again, this is, I didn't know this when I was reading it. Um, but your experience bleeds through the page for sure. Um, and so in the final act, uh, Surat gets, um, uh, basically, uh, tortured and sent through, what could be conceived as as the the Iraqi prisons where all the waterboarding happened, or Guantanamo Bay, depending upon how you want to look at it, it is on an island, so I'm sure it's more supposed to be Guantanamo Bay. But yes, um, very much so. Yes, and uh, which is fine. And that was the part where I said I don't think you can be spoiled because this was one of the first things that was explained to me when my. Um, friend uh, uh, who's also a radical journalist, Mark Conlon was the one that said, oh, you have to read the American War. Um, when I told him that I was working on this, this article. And uh, uh, it was funny because he's one of the people I intend to have on the uh, podcast that I do about the, and at the time I said, well, you've read it, so yeah, you can represent it for me. And then he started <laughs> telling me about it and then I'm like, okay, I wanna read that. <laughs> Uh, I was like, okay, yes, I want to read that. And it was specifically this, this part that was nearing Guantanamo Bay, because I think that it, that's an experience that Americans need more visual on, because I think as much as we know that it's happening and Americans understand that it's happening, but I don't think they're understanding what it would feel like mm -hmm. to be there. So how important was that act of the book for you? It was, it was, I mean, within that section was one of the two hardest parts of the book to write. So almost everything in the book is, uh, sorry, go ahead. You don't have experience with that. You, nobody has access to what's going through with the, with those prisoners, really. Um, I mean, I came close. I spent most of 2008 going back and forth to Guantanamo Bay. Um, so I got to, to tour the, the detention camps. Um, and I got to sit in on the pretrial hearings. Okay, my bad. I... No, 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 but, but I think you're absolutely right in the sense that, so if, to give you an example, the negative space, I mean, it's hard to, to sort of, to really comprehend the negative space of Guantanamo Bay, because at a documentary level, everything you're given, when we would be given the court filings that day, it would just be a set of black lines, because they would censor the hell out of it. So you would get certain you know, one of the, the, the sort of most infuriating examples, one day we're at the court in Guantanamo, and at the end they give us the court filings that day. And there was a defense motion we got, and the motion uh, is mostly black lines, national security, national security, block it all out. And then at the back, there's Appendix A to this motion. Appendix A similarly blocked out, except Appendix A was just a copy of a New York Times article that the defense lawyer had attached so that the judge wouldn't have to go look it up. So immediately all the journalists run to our computers, we bring up the New York Times website, we load up that story, and you can immediately see what the military has determined that is too dangerous for you to read. Now, nobody in the censorship process at any point said, hey, what are we doing here? Why are we censoring a copy of an article that's on the most popular news website on earth that they can immediately look up? 
So there's a lot that you don't you don't get to see. We, for example, there's a there's there were camps one, two, and three, and then they shut them down after a bunch of people killed themselves there. Then there's camp four, which is a medium security prison. Camp five and six, which are super max, and then camp seven, which is a secret facility that we weren't supposed to find out about, except somebody forgot to censor it on one of these court filings. And that's how we found out that there's a secret camp seven where they keep the 9-11 guys, the high value guys, right? Mm. So yeah, I went there, I saw the place, I saw some of these folks who are there, but there's a lot that, that almost nobody will ever get to see. Um, mm. So it, it, it shaped my view, not only of the place, but of how you know, the linguistic violence, the bureaucratic violence, the violence of secrecy, all of these other kinds of violence that need to hold up the physical violence of bombs and guns and shooting and whatnot. Um, so Sugarloaf, everything that happens in Sugarloaf uh, is very much based on, on the stuff I saw and also didn't see there. Um, it's, it, it played a huge, a huge role in my thinking about how, how many different types of violence there are. Mm. Well, and look, at bottom line, um, one thing that I have to say, and I, I don't know if how often I've said this in interviewing authors of books that I've read, but I got to thank you for writing this because um, you're so uniquely set in a position to write this book that you know, nobody else could write it. Like, for example, the last book I read for this was Norman Spinrad's Osama the Gun. And he's a American expat living in Paris, writing this book. And, you know, he could do research and, you know, and his novel was about a new caliphate and, um, you know, and it was written, oh, probably 2006. So he was trying to he was writing about Al Qaeda, basically. Um, and he did some really good things, but um, and some things that I really appreciated in the book. But your experience and what you know as, as a journalist brings such a um, realism to this and such an understanding of, of the issues that once you get into the speculative and the dystop dystopic stuff, um, I think that's you know, uh, what, what makes the book, um, really strong. So I want to thank you for that. Now, um, <laughs> uh, so, so just some bottom line stuff before, before we close up shop, but, um, uh, now that American war has been out for a while, what do you think is the, um, most surprising way that readers reacted to it? And in a positive and hilariously bad way where you're like, okay, I don't understand what they're, what they're seeing. Um, so um, one of the things that, that my publisher did, and I think a lot of publishers do this, is shortly before the book goes to print, they send advance copies to various bookstore owners and try to get feedback from them. Because generally you want, you want indie bookstore owners to love your book because that's how it ends up on, the, on the, those, you know, staff recommendation tables and stuff and that really helps mm. and then for some reason i can't quite figure out why they decided to send me all of the feedback that they got much of which was not like you know not not particularly glowing but i remember distinctly one bookstore owner in texas whose feedback was something like i'm paraphrasing here but it was something like this book shows why a second civil war would be brutal and bloody and why it is necessary and I thought, really? That's what you got from this book? You, got it. you thought I was advocating for a second civil war? That is um, a really interesting uh, take on it. I mean, universally, this book was written, uh, the first draft was written between uh, summer of 2014, summer of 2015. It took me about a year to write the first draft. And about three weeks after I finished the first draft, uh, Trump announced he was running for president. The book ended up coming out April of 2017, so about four months into the Trump administration, and almost immediately, it was taken to be a Trump book. You know, it ended up on all these lists of like the first novels of the Trump era, or the books you need to read to understand the coming moment, or you know that sort of thing. Right. And a lot of the criticism sort of seemed to assume that I sat down in mid-November 2016 
and wrote this book overnight kind of thing, you know, like that it was very much a response to what had happened. And, and you know, that's not how books get written. <laughs> that's not, you know. um, so there's been a lot of that. Um, but also every now and then you get somebody who knows enough about the Middle East to know that Camp Patience is a reference to uh, Sabra and Shatia. Uh, Sabra is the Arabic word for patience. So they, oh, they, they think, okay, you're referencing a massacre that happened in a refugee camp in Lebanon 40 years ago. Okay, I get that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I subscribe to the notion that once the book leaves the author's hands, it doesn't matter in the slightest what they think of it or what they think it should be. Um, and it was difficult for me to accept that early on, but it's become a very comforting thing for me to, you know, just let go and just watch the curling stone kind of move down the ice away from me and, and uh, it'll go whatever direction it goes. Well, I had two really interesting experiences with interviewing other uh, authors this year. Uh, Paul Tremblay, who wrote um, a pandemic novel that came out this year called Survivor Song. And of course, he had no idea, <laughs> you know, that was going to happen. And, and um, I interviewed uh, Josh Mallerman, who is the author of Bird Box. And he just put out a sequel, Mallory, and a huge part of the book in Mallory is, and I'm sure you've seen the movie Bird Box, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So a huge part of the sequel is, a de is basically characters debating whether they need to wear that blindfold anymore. Huh. Um, and he had no idea that the mass debate was going to be a thing, but Mallory's son in the book believes that they can do something better than, than the blindfold, that they can they don't need it anymore, that, that there's too much of a crush. And it's, you know, it was funny because when I read Mallory this year and I, I was just stunned, you know, like, and so when I interviewed Josh, he was just like, no, nope, had no idea. <laughs> it's just total coincidence. <laughs> and so much like your uh, first book of the Trump era. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's got to be something when like people... You know, this is being recorded November 1st. So, you know, most people will be listening. Well, everyone will be listening to this after election day because I'm not putting it out tomorrow. But so whatever happens, happens. But um, I've definitely seen reviews of the American war in the last, that, that people have read it in the last year that feel that that tension or that idea of a second civil war being closer than ever. Um, and well, I don't personally think it is. I that tension is real. That that concern is real, and I think that it it makes the American War a different book um, in these times. Just like Mallory is a different book than when Josh wrote it, because it got uh, unleashed in the virus year, you know. And yeah. I, coming in, especially in the wake of George Floyd. Um, which I think changed the game forever um, because I think the two Americas, um, I think, well, two, there might be more than two Americas here, you know, but the divides that, that are going on are very hard to, to ignore. And I think this novel really speaks to that. And, and that's one of the things that, that I really appreciated about it. That yeah, thank you so much. Go Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say thank you. That's, that's, that's very, very kind. Well, yeah, and, and, and I, um, you know, I'm going to be kind of a e evangelical about this book and wanting people to, to get out there and read it. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. It's that I think, to me, the idea of the Arabs, the, the consecutive Arab Springs that didn't work, that could conceivably happen is one of the speculative notes that I really enjoyed in the book. I think that's one of the reasons why I dog-eared it. Um, what do you think, in your experience of having traveled um, um, over, overseas and covered these conflicts, um, what do you think is the biggest takeaway that um, you would hope that, the, I know you said it's out in the reader's hands, but um, but what do you think is the, the primary thing that you, you want people to get out of reading The American War? 
I mean, I, I, on a very surface level, I hope that it's taken as an anti-war book. Um, I hope that it is taken um, as a starting point to think about people and situations and, and the great currents of geopolitics that if you live in this part of the world, maybe you have the privilege of not having to think about. Um, you know, I, I get a lot as a result of, of my name and my religion, and you know, a Muslim guy named Omar wrote a book in which Americans are killing each other and 100 million of them die and so on and so forth. I get a lot of like, well, if you don't like it, go back where you came from and, and that sort of thing. And I get that. Um, you know, there's 300 million people in this country. A lot of them are going to turn out to be assholes. That's just statistics. Wow. Um, I, I, I do want to push the idea that what you should really be terrified of is not the criticism. It should be the day when the criticism stops. And what I mean by that is, you know, after the Arab Spring fell apart and after in places like Egypt, we replaced one dictator with, you know, we had elections, we elected a bumbling idiot, we got rid of the bumbling idiot, and now we're back to a dictatorship. And that broke my heart to such a degree that I don't bother criticizing Egypt anymore, mm -hmm. right? I'm never going to write a book that is, uh, you know, can be seen as, a, as an allegorical criticism of that country. And that is such a grim thing. And the day that I stop criticizing the United States is the day that I have lost hope completely in this country. And I think the same is true for a lot of those people who are out on the streets right now. Yeah, it looks bad when the McDonald's get, gets burnt down and, and it's all very terrible and, and property loss and so on and so forth. The day that the terrible things keep happening but the people stop responding is the day that your, your society has been broken in a much deeper fashion. Um, so, you know, I'm going to keep criticizing the things I don't like about this country for as long as I write. Um, and, and if I stop, it'll mean that I've lost hope. It'll mean that I think that this country is irreparably broken. So if you're looking for something hopeful in what is otherwise a stone cold bummer of a novel, uh, it's that. Um, what is there a way that we can get more um, Muslim voices writing speculative fiction? Um, because I think that's one of the, the real strengths here is that, well, I mean, like um, Osama's Lavi Tidar, which is, he's Israeli, uh, Norman Spinrad um, is Jewish as well, um, uh, not practicing, but, uh, you know, culturally. Um, and so a lot of these people that are writing these speculative fiction are, are not coming. And that's one of the reasons why I realized I had to read your book is <laughs> I wanted to get a Muslim perspective, but, um, and I know it's, it's part of the thing is, is that we're probably not going to get a lot of that. I, I don't know though, because I say that, and I, the last year I've been discovering how much Chinese science fiction there is that I didn't realize existed. Um, but like what is there a way that we as readers can encourage more um muslim voices to to strike out into speculative fiction so that's a really interesting question um there's there's a billion plus muslims in the world right and and culturally um it's it's very very the most populous uh, muslim nation on earth is indonesia i know almost nothing about indonesian fiction um Part of that is my own ignorance. The biggest part of that is my own ignorance, but also uh, it is a fact of the publishing industry that a lot more English language titles get translated into other languages than other languages back into English. There's a very famous story in the 80s of uh, Edward Said trying to get the work of Naguib Mahfouz translated into English and all the publishing houses keep turning him down. And finally he says, listen, this is the most famous Arab novelist alive. Like if you're gonna translate somebody, you have to, you have to start with him. Uh, and one of the publishers tells him, well, we'd love to, but you know, Arab, Arabic is a very controversial language. And I think about that phrase a lot because it's, there's a lot buried in there, this idea of a language being controversial. Um, I think that the best thing anyone can do in this kind of situation is, you know, not so much go out and read more Muslim voices, but just, just be cognizant of 
how wide that spectrum is. Um, you know, the, the, the famous books in the, in, the, in the category to which American War generally belongs are basically 1984, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, um, you know, there's like three or four books, right, that, that, that keep coming up time and time again. And whenever anything happens with the surveillance states, everybody goes out and, and goes and buys 1984 and it pops back to the top of the bestseller list. Great, fantastic. But after you've read those three or four, like surely there's, there must be an appetite for more. Um, I would urge people to go look at the small presses that are translating stuff into English that is not particularly profitable to translate. Um, because those, those presses can really use your help. And I don't care if those writers are Muslim or not. I, I just, there is something very um, nourishing for the soul in going out and seeing how other people tackle the same topic. I've read books translated from Arabic that I have despised. Um, there's a book I read recently that had won basically the biggest literary award in the Arab world. It's a, it's a book called Velvet and it's, it's about a Palestinian refugee camp. And I couldn't stand it. I thought it was overly dramatic. And I think a lot of that has to do with the very literal translation of certain Arabic terms that make it sound like we're all in the middle of a soap opera over there and we're all talking in like high drama all of the time. But it also was just a way of looking at things that after living in, in this part of the world for 20 plus years, I had sort of, that muscle had atrophied in my brain and it was a way to sort of work it a little bit. Um, so I would urge people go out, find the indie presses that are translating smaller titles, mm -hmm. get your hands on those, if only just to, to see the spectrum of things because otherwise you're stuck reading the same three books that are in the canon and in the Pantheon and the Pantheon gets really fucking boring after a while. And I'm, and I'm sure it's just my ignorance that there are, um, Muslim and Middle Eastern science fiction writers I'm just not aware of. Um, I've well, again, a lot of this stuff hasn't been translated, right? Like some of the great Arab science fiction um, just hasn't been translated because who the hell is going to buy it? Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly not, not a function of your ignorance. It's just the marketplace and the way the marketplace is set up. Well, and, and we've been really lucky with the success of the three body problem that um, mm -hmm. Chinese science fiction has started to um, get translated now, and um, I have a, a friend who um, has a business doing Japanese translations, science fiction and horror, and it's funny because um, I think he would love to have a success like that that propelled a lot of other people <laughs> to, to read the Japanese stuff too, um, but I, and I'm sure it's out there and in the process of looking for this article, I'm sure I'll find it. And I know I want to read um, uh, Frankenstein and, and Baghdad. That sounds incredible. Um, but uh, uh, Omar, this was awesome. Uh, I could talk to you for a long time um, about just uh, what's, you know, your experience as a reporter. Um, I have my stepbrother covered um, Central Command and Qatar uh, as a reporter. And um, I got, I talked to him about his perspective of being there, but again, it's within the wire, you know, and I think um, my friend who is the embedded journalist and when, when you guys are, are out there that it's underrated how important that reporting and bringing it back to, to our part of the world uh, is. And because I'm a, a big believer in speculative fiction, um, I think, um, what you did with this book is, is is really important because I think sometimes it's like the sugar coating on on um, something that would otherwise not taste well going down, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a very entertaining book um, uh, beyond the fact that it has really good things to say. So what's coming up next? You have another book that's coming out here soon. I do. I have a book that's coming out in, uh, I'm just finishing up actually, the, the final edits is coming out in July of next year. Uh, it's called The World's Strange Paradise. It's a very small book. It's a very quiet book. Um, if you loved American War, you're probably going to hate this thing. <laughs> so I have no idea if it's going to be commercially or critically successful in any way. Um, but it's a reinterpreted fable. It's uh, the story of Peter Pan reinterpreted as a story of a uh, modern day child refugee. 
And um, again, I have no idea if it, if it has any chance in hell. Certainly, I don't think it's going to. Um, well, I don't, the thing is, I have no idea if next year is even going to happen. You know, it's sort of, it's really hard to make any kind of predictions anymore about what the world's going to look like two weeks from now, let alone a year. Um, but that's coming down the pipeline. And otherwise, I just, um, I generally am working on a couple of short stories and that sort of thing. All right. Well, it was great talking to you. Um, I will uh, continue to stay in touch with you about um, this article that I'm working on and, and uh, let you know when the podcast comes out. But I really appreciate your time. And um, thank you for writing this incredible book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.